All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a little bit of time here to talk about evolution, uh, starting at the macro lens and then heading on down to the micro lens. We're going to talk through it and then we're going to get an FRQ. Um, really, evolution and the reason we called it, er we covered it earlier in the year is the answer to almost all questions in biology. Why do the, all these weird things occur? Well, it's because it gave the ancestors some sort of biological advantage. Um, it, uh, it evolved that way, that's, that's why. Um, so, so generally speaking, evolution uh, is talked about at um, uh, above the species level in large groups of organisms, um, that's macroevolution. Um, and just a definition of species uh, is uh, a good one I like is re reproductively isolated population. So they must be isolated from, from different groups and they're able to interbreed and produce fertile offspring. Remember that this is our definition of species because uh, when we talk about speciation later, um, that's what we're, we're driving towards. And just, uh, we're gonna get into these uh, a whole bunch later. Um, uh, actually, we're gonna get them to them right now. Um, really the drivers of evolution. It's not just natural selection, even though they're used uh, pretty much uh, synonymously sometimes. Uh, we're gonna talk about these other types too to get us to macroevolution. So the first thing that needs to happen um, for uh, evolution to occur is you need to have mutation. You need to have some way to change the organisms and make them different from each other. Um, otherwise things won't change. Um, so if, in our little example here, we're gonna say some green genes uh, mutate to brown genes. And now you have some variation in your population. Uh, although this leads to evolution, it does not account for all the big changes from one generation to the other. So we're gonna go into those other ones. And remember mutation occurs at the DNA level. Um, migration or gene flow uh, could be when one group uh, with their alleles moves into another group. That would change the allele frequencies, um, you know, the DNA frequencies. And as such, you again have, um, have evolution um, because really evolution is just a change in, in allele frequencies, a change in the frequency of different genes. So that's migration uh, where immigration in or emigration out. And then there's something called genetic drift. And I think this one might be the most tricky for people to understand. Um, but this is basically a change in a um, uh, in allele frequency due to random luck. So it isn't natural selection. There isn't a, a reason. It's, it's just um, for whatever reason, random luck, some genes get passed on more frequently or less frequently to uh, the others. Um, so uh, note, you know, in this original population, you have 75% and 25%. Well, just because some got passed on one way or the other, um, uh, you have 71% and 29%. So the allele frequencies change, but there isn't really a reason that they changed other than just random luck. And uh, I, I'm not gonna take the time to, to ask you guys, cause we've got a lot to cover, um, but, um, Genetic drift happens more in a small population. Um, and it's because, you know, their one little change can lead to a much bigger impact on the total population. Whereas if you have a really large population, then if just one organism doesn't mate or one organism has more children than the others, um, that is not going to um, change the frequencies nearly as much as if there was a little tiny population like we saw in the last slide. So genetic drift note um, is most common in small populations. All right. And then the big one that, that everybody thinks of is a uh, natural selection where, you know, you got that mutated uh, brown gene uh, and these beetles live in a brown environment. Well, then they are gonna have uh, an adaptation that is advantageous. Uh, and the green ones are gonna get eaten by some predator more than uh, others. And as such, you will see generation to generation that you get a whole lot more brown than you would expect just due to random or even due to mutation. Uh, you would see the bigger change because one of them is being selected against. 
um, which is you know natural selection. Probably the thing that you're most familiar with with evolution. Now, if we talk about species, like I alluded to at the beginning of the, um, the little review, um, there are many different ways you can get um, uh, different species, uh, but you need to have some sort of barrier to reproduction in order to get um, uh, a new species. So that can be due to uh, geographic isolation, like you get a mountain between them. Um, the barrier could be ecological, um, where you know one type makes different colors and the other type doesn't, and that could mean you know they're not going to mate because they're not looking for the same type of mate. Could be temporal, meaning uh, you know if one blooms early and one blooms later, then they're not going to be able to to mate to each other. That's a time isolation. Uh, it could be behavioral, you know, uh, birds singing different songs. Um, you know, if you're if you know your mates have one type of jam and you sing a different type of jam, um, uh, then you are not going to mate. Um, so that would be behavioral isolation. Could be mechanical isolation. If your parts don't work together, then you cannot mate. Um, that is, you know, a mechanical barrier to um, to mating. And then gametic isolation. Say you aren't able to mate, all of these things go well, but the spermatozoa can't join with the egg in that species for whatever reason. Uh, could be chromosomal differences, could be um, differences in, uh, you know, shell and what can get into um, the, uh, the actual, I shouldn't say shell, I should say membrane, and what can get into the membrane. If that doesn't work, um, then you have a barrier. Uh, these are called uh, pre-reproductive barriers or um, Prezygotic barriers, meaning they all keep a zygote from being formed, a fertilized egg from being formed, um, and, and they lead to speciation through that way. And then post-reproductive -re barriers, I think these are the more confusing type, but say all of these things happen. They're in the right place. They're at the right time. They, they sing the right song or you know impress the, the female in the right way. Um, but... All of this happens, they mate, the, the, the zygote is formed, but they just don't make um, viable offspring. Well, that is a post-reproductive uh, barrier to that, you know, being, being a species, those, those two organisms being the same species. So um, uh, basically reduced hybrid viability if, if they make a hybrid, meaning, you know, organisms that, that are essentially two different species coming together to make one um, organism. Um, if they're not viable, meaning they're not healthy enough to, to live and reproduce. If they're not, if they're healthy, but they can't reproduce, they, they're infertile, they, they don't make uh, fertile eggs, they don't make fertile spermatozoa, or they just break down. This happens most frequently in plants where it's kind of like viability, but it's just kind of like a combination of between the two. They're, they're just weak um, and can't um, break down or, or they, they have differences in chromosomes. They become polyploidy, like, uh, um, like they, they uh, cell divide and, and they divided the wrong number of chromosomes. Anyway, these are post-reproductive barriers or post-zygotic barriers to uh, reproduction as well. Okay, and at this time I've talked already quite a bit uh, and I will ask, um, are there any questions? If no, then I'm going to keep on keeping on. Okie dokie, not seeing any questions. So I'm going to talk about different types of selection, you know, um, uh, natural selection being the most common uh, type and the type that you think about most frequently with, um, uh, you know, selection. Um, uh, it's going to, uh, you know, it can be divided into its own different types. So um, I'll ask you this this question and see if you remember. Um, this picture illustrates what type of selection, A, B, C, or D, do you remember? Is it A, sexual, B, disruptive, C, uh, directional, or destabilizing. Which one is it? Get Try your answers, uh, even if you're not quite sure, uh, and then we're going to go on. Okay, so um, let's see. 
Jewels said. All right. Um, it is stabilizing. Absolutely. So the extremes are um, uh, not selected for, and the middle is, you know, that uh, intermediate phenotype is. And this could be, um, you know, size issue, you know, maybe only a certain size organism can live in a, in a habitat, like a certain size hole. And that if you're, uh, and if you're too small, you know, you get eaten or trapped or something, then um, uh, that would be lead to stabilizing selection based on body size. The too big, they get eaten because they can't get into the holes. The too small, they get eaten because they're weak and other things can catch them. But right in the middle, that's the sweet spot. And that is called uh, stabilizing selection. Um, so uh, in addition to stabilizing selection, you might have um, directional uh, selection, um, which is, whoop, uh, I guess, uh, where one extreme is uh, selected for, and like the beetle population where uh, brown would be selected uh, for relative to, you know, green, that would be uh, directional selection. Uh, and then the, um, the other one um, would be disruptive selection, um, where there is a normal, you know, initial phenotype, but then you get uh, these two extreme phenotypes. The middle doesn't work anymore, um, or is, is selected against, and then these two different phenotypes, uh, you know, and this one maybe again, uh, I like to think of, you know, body size again, sometimes this happens where uh, big, big organisms can fight, small organisms are better at fleeing, and the ones in the middle just aren't good at great at either, so they're selected against. Uh, this is just another example, um, directional selection is um, you know, going to be down here where, you know, large organisms are selected for. Um, stabilizing selection is, you know, one phenotype is selected for and the initial is selected against or that the extremes are selected against. And then um, uh, disruptive is, you know, where different colors are um, selected for and just that intermediate isn't for whatever reason. Okay. Uh, and all of these, again, can lead to speciation. Um, uh, each one of these things, I, I'm not going to, to, to point it out, but, but polyploidy, that's again, you, you get a different number of chromosomes and all of a sudden you're a new species. This happens in plants a lot. Genetic drift can, natural selection, recombination. This is something we're gonna talk about later uh, more with meiosis, geographic isolation, reproductive isolation, all of these lead to speciation. And then, um, um, again, speciation, that's the creation of new species. Um, if speciation occurs and there is an isolation of two, popul two populations, uh, that is called allopatric speciation. This is just, you know, vocab uh, that's worth uh, reminding yourself of. And then uh, if they're in the same area, they're going to be sympatric speciation. So this would uh, need to have something like a mechanical um, uh, isolation or... Um, uh, maybe a temporal, you know, they're in the same place, but they, you know, one's out at night and one's out during the day, something, something like that, so that they can be isolated and they can be speciated, uh, but still be in the same area. Uh, real brief about evidence for evolution. Um, you know, oftentimes and historically, the, you know, scientists would um, just look at comparative anatomy uh, in order to, you know, categorize things as different species or, you know, give, um, uh, you know, evidence for, for evolution. You know, if you, any of these uh, organisms all have the same kind of, uh, even though the morphology is very different, you know, uh, wings uh, are different than flippers, are different than uh, horse feet, are different than humans, uh, you know, arms, uh, the same number of bones are all present in all of them, uh, strongly suggesting that, you know, we all evolved from a, um, a common ancestor, uh, you know, embryo wise, uh, we all, uh, most animals follow a very similar um, starting point and end up at a, uh, you know, we look very different at the end, but if you look at embryos of, you know, fish versus chickens versus, uh, you know, humans, uh, we start very, very similar and then evolve into the different morphologies. Um, biogeography, this is, you know, looking at different fossils in different places, 
um, and how similar they are. Uh, again, fossil record ties into biogeography. Uh, and then uh, molecular biology is now the most common evidence for evolution. If you look at uh, different proteins in different organisms and you find out they're very, very, very similar, except for some differences, even though the animals don't look the same, that strongly suggests that we evolved from a, uh, a common uh, ancestor. And that this is the most frequent use of, um, or a way where uh, research is done on evolution today. So I'm gonna ask you another question. This one's a little longer and I'm gonna give you just a little bit more time on it. Um, maybe I'll give you a full minute. Try to answer this question here and then we'll talk through it. All right, so, um, oh, and he even changed it. So um, yes, um, E is the correct answer here. Um, uh, y'all, y'all didn't get fooled, um, but but remember this: that uh, differences in amino acid sequence do mean you know they are good evidence for um, differences. Uh, in lineage. Um, uh, so, so things that have fewer differences are more closely related to one another than things that have, um, you know, more similar number of uh, differences. More differences means, uh, you know, farther back uh, common ancestor. Um, and y'all weren't, y'all weren't tricked by, by these other ones. Good on you. Um, and then other, uh, we talked about this more recently. Uh, good evidence for uh, evolution um, is endosymbiosis as well. You know, uh, mitochondria and um, uh, mitochondria and chloroplasts, they have their own DNA. Uh, the DNA looks just like prokaryotes. Um, they, you know, have that double wall suggesting that, you know, there is the, the ancient uh, wall and then the, the, you know, actual prokaryotic uh, membrane. Um, uh, all of this suggests that, you know, cells, even at a cellular level, we see evolution uh, to eukaryotic cells like we have today. Um, and then phylogenetics, I think, is the most confusing thing outside of Hardy Weinberg. So we're going to talk about that next. Uh, remember, this is called a cladogram. Um, the lines are not necessarily quantitative. But uh, you know they show the relatedness of species. Um, phylogenetic trees are going to show shared derived characters sometimes, uh, and they're usually based on DNA, protein, or sequence data. Um, so just some terminology for reading um, phylogenetic trees. Um, the common ancestor between A and B is always found at this node. Um, which is just, yeah, where they split off into each other and there was a speciation event and they became different organisms. Um, that is when they shared an ancestor um, is shown where the lines come together. And all of these organisms um, are, share a common ancestor if you go all the way to this node, and this is called the root of the phylogenetic tree. And generally it goes in time where, you know, the, uh, most recent present day species are uh, listed together and then they all go back in time to uh, where they had common ancestors. Um, and just remind you as well that um, every one of these um, phylogenetic trees 
uh, is the same. Um, you can rotate about a node because it does not matter how close organisms are in physical space. What does matter in terms of relatedness is how far back you have to go in time to find their ancestor. Um, so D and C can be here or D and C can be here. And um, it looking like this is exactly the same as turning it on its side where this is the root and these are the um, uh, modern day species. Um, and also remember um, that uh, trees are hypotheses. Um, so we don't know exactly what they are. We, we just speculate based on evidence um, and they are always under revision when we get more data and computers are super duper helpful in uh, figuring that information out. Um, these are uh, you know, shared derived characters and you can create um, your own cladograms either from derived characters like this or um, amino acid or DNA differences. Um, hint, we're gonna practice uh, doing that um, uh, on the FRQ today, creating your own uh, cladogram in addition to uh, some other information. Um, but uh, yeah, if um, you, uh, to, to do this, um, remind, remind you, if something is earlier in time, like an amniotic egg, that suggests that all of the organisms after that, you know, if you think of this as like a Y axis in time, and this is earlier time and this is later time, um, all of the organisms after this point um, have amniotic eggs. So, uh, you know, mammals, crocodiles, birds, uh, turtles, and lizards, if we were to fill these in, um, all of them would have, um, uh, you know, the amniotic egg, because they all have, have X's here. But if we wanted to, you know, figure out where um, a certain, maybe I'll even ask this question. So where do you think birds are on this, um, uh, this here? So why don't you answer that question? A, B, C, or D, where do you think birds are on this cladogram? All right, so um, it is indeed E, yes. So birds have an amniotic egg, a nucleated um, red blood cell, no outer shell um, like a turtle would have. Uh, birds have legs and they also have wings. So birds cannot be in this position because that suggests that this organism in A doesn't have nucleated red blood cells, no outer shells, and all have legs. It does not have those um, if it is up here. Uh, so it can't, same reason can be A, B, C, or D, or E, or it has to be E because it has all of these characters. Um, D must be um, crocodiles because again, crocodiles have an amniotic egg. They have nucleated red blood cells. They have no outer shell and they uh, all have legs, so they would have to be right here. But they don't have wings, so they're gonna be right here before wings show up as derived characters. Do I have any questions about cladograms right now or phylogenetic trees? Okay. All right, um, then if there are none, I'm gonna talk about Hardy Weinberg. So an important thing to remember with Hardy Weinberg uh, is that these um, uh, conditions must be met for you to be in Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. Uh, remember, Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is, is really where there is no evolution occurring. And we figured this out 
um, just you know to figure out what what we would expect to occur in um, uh, you know in a population you know what what frequencies are uh, but we also can use this to measure how much evolution is occurring because if we expect you know we look at this it's kind of like a null hypothesis there's probably a word you haven't thought about a whole lot recently um, but yes um, Hardy Weinberg like a null hypothesis there's no evolution occurring so that if you measure um, you know, frequencies and you see, okay, it's not in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, then we know evolution has occurred. So remember that. Um, and the assumptions for it are that there's no selection at all. Um, there's no mutation in the population. Uh, there's no migration in the population. Um, there's a very, very large population. So genetic drift isn't occurring. And there's completely random mating, so there's no sexual selection. Um, you know, different mates don't like different types of mates. So in all reality, Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is very, very, very unlikely to ever occur. But again, by finding it, we can see how much evolution is occurring by seeing how much you vary from Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. But anywho, uh, other things to remember with Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Um, the population symbol. So again, if you see this, this two, th these are really squared. So, so don't, don't get tricked by that. But, um, you know, P squared, 2PQ and Q squared, those are all, you know, population symbols. Those are all frequencies of actual individuals in the population, whereas P and Q are allele frequencies. Uh, and they are, they actually mean how much, you know, one piece of DNA uh, is uh, going to be uh, present in, in a population. Um, and also um, uh, uh, remember that organisms have, you know, a mother and, a, you know, any organism that has, uh, you know, sexual reproduction is going to have a mother and a father version. Uh, so you are going to have two versions of each um, uh, two alleles of each uh, gene in, in your cells. So uh, don't forget, you're going to look at what is given and what you have to do to solve for it. So here's that question. Um, a study reveals that 25% of a population of 1,000 have attached earlobes, which is a homozygous recessive trait. So these are the two things I want you to answer. What is the frequency of recessive allele? And then what percentage are heterozygous? So I want you to solve this. And then I am going to um, go through it. And as soon as you have these two answers, drop them in the chat.
Zoom recording. And share my whole screen again. And uh, pull up my hover cam. All right. Uh, can I get another confirmation that you guys can see this? Yeah, we can, we can see it. Okay, excellent. So um, hopefully you noticed if they said 25% of um, the population. Uh, so this is just, you know, 25%. 25% of the population is uh, has the attached earlobes, you know, the homozygous recessive um, condition then that means that 0.25 is your Q squared. So they're, if they're actually talking about a frequency of individuals, that is not Q, that is going to be Q squared. So if you wanted to find the frequency of the allele, like it asked for in the first question, um, you need to take the square root of Q squared and 0.25 you take the square root and you get Q equals 0.5. So let's remember frequency of um, the recessive allele. Okay. And then uh, it also, that was, so that was the first part. The, the frequency of the allele is just going to be 0.5. That's the first answer. Uh, the second answer is asked for, you know, what percentage were heterozygous? Call this A, call that B. Uh, so for heterozygous, we use 2PQ. Um, and 2PQ, that means we need to know what P is. So we use P plus Q equals one. We know this, that's the frequency of the allele equation. We know P plus 0.5 equals one. Uh, and then we solve for that, we subtract 0.5 to both sides and we get P equals 0.5. So 2PQ is then 2 times P times Q, 2 times the frequency of the dominant allele, times the frequency of the recessive allele, uh, which gives you 0.5. But it asks for the percentage, so you need to turn this into a percentage, which you do by multiplying by a hundred and turning it into a percentage. Okay. So do you have any questions on Hardy Weinberg? Okay. Maybe just some labeling. This is dominant, but dominant allele. Um, P squared is individuals uh, that are homozygous dominant. And Q squared is individuals. We didn't use that, I guess we did, but that are homozygous recessive. Okay. And I will check the chat question. Uh, yeah, we can do another practice problem. I would actually like you to, rather than me spending time looking for it right now, I want to switch to the FRQ. Um, and then uh, while you guys are doing your FRQ, I will find another uh, Hardy-Weinberg problem. Is that cool?